Thank you very much indeed. I have never worn one of these things. And when they mic me up like this, I'm thinking, you know, my friends back in Tuscaloosa are going to just have a, just be rolling when they watch this video. And, and the Department of Archives and History is good, good to put these videos on YouTube. So if you ever can't make one and you want to watch it, it's all there. Um, but I do want to thank the Alabama Department of Archives and History for inviting me to address you today. Uh, they've got a lot of new things going on here. I heard for the first time, had it confirmed to me, that uh, the, the building is haunted uh, by Mrs. Owen, uh, who, if you don't know her, look her up. She's pretty important here. Uh, this is a great place. And I want to thank you for being here. Uh, it's a pretty day outside, and so to have folks come in to listen to a history lecture uh, is, is really fun for me. So thank you very much. Let me begin my remarks about this book, which is 1865 Alabama, From Civil War to an Uncivil Peace. And it, of course, it focuses on 1865 in Alabama but it includes a lot more than just what was going on in Alabama. I want to preface my remarks by saying I'm not a Democrat, even though I'm a lawyer. I'm not a Republican, even though I'm a lawyer. I'm just a lawyer. And I think I'm a historian as well. I'm not a conservative. I'm not a liberal. I was born in, in Tennessee, you heard me introduce, I was born in Chattanooga, but I intentionally avoid writing from a Southern or Northern perspective. And that may surprise some of y'all because a lot of people want to hear their version of history. And they get very uncomfortable when someone says something that doesn't jive with what they've been taught. Like my first book, I wrote this one for you. You may think, well, he doesn't know me. I'm writing them for all Alabamians because we don't know our history very well. There have been a lot of books written about different aspects of Alabama history, uh, but there's a lot that hasn't been written, and I'm trying to cover those in my books. And the way I look at it, after over 150 years, you're entitled to know the facts. Everybody agree with that? Facts are good. Propaganda is not. Because my goal is to help all of us understand how in the world we got to the situation we're in today. And a lot of what is still around starts in 1865, believe it or not. A very important year, to me, the most important year in Alabama history. And one of the main themes in it is to explain why the Civil War and post-war periods ended so badly for Alabama and how many of the problems could have been avoided. Part of the story is military, of course. At the beginning of 1865, Alabamians are just learning what's happened to the Army of Tennessee up in Nashville. And what had happened was not good for the Confederacy or for Alabama. Uh, Hood's army was crushed, routed, they just barely made it back south across the Tennessee River. And it was a miracle that they got across the Tennessee River at that time of year, which would have been December. This is before all the dams are up there and the water is raging. That was the only army left in this part of the south that could protect Alabama. And a lot of it what was left of it ended up in Tupelo, and then Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, 
sent most of it east to try to run down Sherman, who has gone through Georgia and is now on his way uh, up the coast, up those uh, east coast states to help Grant put an end to Lee's army. So if you think about it, Alabama was a sitting duck. And any idea of Confederate independence at this point was a pipe dream. Alabama had a lot to lose. Of course, one thing was slavery. Another was white supremacy. We're going to talk about those concepts in a little bit. And then finally, and just as significantly, they might lose, and of course eventually did lose, the remaining industrial base of the state, which was located in the industrial corridor coming down from Jefferson County to Selma. Uh, if you know anything about the history of Selma, you know that that is a military industrial complex during the war, most of the war, and a lot of the raw materials are coming from Jefferson County, what is now Chilton County, uh, and, and Shelby County, and those areas. So there's a big downside if the war continues. A part of the story of 1865 is political. There's a, because of all of these things, there's a peace movement uh, that is gaining strength, increasing support for a negotiated peace. And Abraham Lincoln, who's the main topic of my talk today, and, and just one of the many themes in this book, I'm not going to talk about a tenth of the book, uh, do read it, you'll learn something you didn't know, or probably a lot you didn't know. But Abraham Lincoln is an important part of this aspect of the story. Now let me say, I think Abraham Lincoln was our greatest president. Does anybody else agree with that? Several. And I won't ask those that don't to raise their hands. Um, you may think, well, gosh, he was the president and, and uh, his armies defeated the Confederacy. How could he be the greatest president? Well, we know through his efforts that he preserved the Union. So we don't have to speak German now. Uh, and he moved the nation toward the end of slavery. It was going to have to happen sometime. But he wasn't perfect. How many of you all agree with that? Even more. Now, one thing that I was kind of taken aback by in sifting through what happened in 1865, and when I say sifting, I mean literally sifting little bits of information all that year and kind of taking a microscope to what happened and when during that year, I came to what I think is an unavoidable conclusion that may surprise you, did me. If Lincoln had been allowed to carry out his plan for reconstruction, the plan that he had in 1865, our nation might never have achieved the progress it has made in the area of political and civil rights. Now, don't go home and, and, and say that Chris McElwain said he's glad that Lincoln got assassinated. I'm not saying that, but it's just the way history turned out. The assassination changed things. How many people have ever heard the statement, Lincoln is the South's best friend, or that he was? Have you ever heard that? One, two, three, anybody else? I know Mills has. Mills is already asleep. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. He was widely known as of that before his assassination. 
And you may think, well, how could that possibly be? I'll tell you that he was certainly the white South's best friend. And I don't see that, say that in a uh, critical way. It's just the way it was. And it was that way because he was constrained by circumstances and the law. You know, he was a lawyer, too. And he understood the Constitution really well. How many of y'all have ever read the federal Constitution in its entirety? A few? Okay. That's a lot in there. And even for lawyers, it's tough. I, I'm a litigator, and, and uh, you get involved in constitutional issues pretty regularly. Uh, it's tough for lawyers to keep up with. They, uh, it, and when I was going through law school back in the late 70s, you took two semesters of constitutional law. Now I can tell you, you could take 50 semesters of constitutional law and still not understand it all. So it's even tougher for a layperson to, to get into it. But you gotta remember what Lincoln was dealing with. He was dealing with everything that was in effect prior to the war from a constitutional standpoint. Prior to the war, slavery was not prohibited by the federal constitution or federal law. Now you've all heard of the doctrine of state rights. That doctrine was supreme. Each state had the authority or the right to determine whether slavery would be legal and protected or prohibited within its borders. That's one of the state rights. And when you hear people saying, well, what? we fought the Civil War over state rights, I think that's misleading, but part of the, the under the penumbra of state rights relates to the issue of discrimination and who has the right to vote. Before the war, discrimination in suffrage rights, voting rights, employment, access to public accommodations was not prohibited. And we know now it is. And without certain changes in the law between 1865 and today, uh, it would, still wouldn't be prohibited. Each state had the authority or right to determine who could vote and what individual rights would be guaranteed. So states had rights. You don't really think about that now, but they had rights before the war and they still had during the war. And the only way to change that was to adopt constitutional amendments. Because unless the Constitution was amended, Congress didn't have the authority to get involved in these issues of would slavery be allowed, who had the right to vote, could folks be discriminated against based on race or other reasons. So from the, from the standpoint of one faction of Northerners, they wanted to abolish slavery. They wanted to guarantee equal protection of the laws and they wanted to prohibit discrimination and voting rights. That was kind of what was in at issue here in 1865, but amending our Constitution is, has never been easy. Basic civics lesson, uh, and I'm sure you remember it by hard Article 4 of the Constitution. Lawyers don't remember it either. But you could, there were two ways to amend the Constitution. A constitutional convention 
could be called at the request of two-thirds of the state legislature. So if more than a third of the state legislatures refuse to call, uh, no constitutional convention. And that's why it's never happened under our Constitution, a change through a constitutional uh, convention. And you may think, well, there was a constitutional convention that wrote the Constitution right, but there was no procedure for it. It was just done and ultimately ratified. The other way to, to amend the Constitution is that a, an amendment be adopted by two-thirds majority of the U.S. House and U.S. Senate. Imagine trying to get anybody together today to, to vote for something two-thirds. You know, even if it's just to, to honor uh, servicemen, you might get some negatives in that. But even if you got it through Congress, it had to be ratified by three-fourths of the state legislatures. Now, I know your eyes are starting to glaze over, but the bottom line of all of that is minority controls whether there's going to be a constitutional amendment. In other words, a conservative minority can basically control it all. And hence, over 11,000 amendments have been proposed in Congress since the, the Constitution was first ratified, and only 27 have been enacted. Not a good batting average. And so when you see people on TV talk about, let's amend the Constitution to deal with gun rights and, or gun wrongs, uh, that's an uphill battle. Now, there are ways to finagle that that I won't go into today, but that's the, the problem. And let's apply those, those procedural issues to the post-Civil War constitutional amendments. There were three of them. One, the 13th Amendment. It prohibits slavery except for those who are convicted of a crime, basically. It was approved by the U.S. Senate in 1864, but stalled in the House until late January of 1865. And you may think, well, the South doesn't have its delegations in Congress. How in the world could they not get this constitutional amendment approved in the House with no Southern delegations there? Pretty amazing. And if you look, if you watch the movie Lincoln, where they're trying to get the 13th Amendment through Congress, I mean, the, the moral of that story is, is there were a lot of people in Congress that were opposed to it. Of course, the Democratic Party was very opposed to it. And some of the Democrats who are portrayed in that movie don't come out looking too good. Again, I'm not a Democrat or Republican. I'm just telling you, watch that movie. You'll see some of that stuff. But they were adamant. And the more, another moral of the story is, but, you know, people's uh, objections, their morals are flexible, especially when there's some cash involved. So uh, you saw that some in the movie. But they got it through Congress. How in the world is it going to be approved or ratified by three-fourths of the state legislatures? Certainly more than a fourth of the state legislatures, if you, if you count the southern legislatures, would oppose it. You know, the state of Mississippi did not ratify it until 1995. So we're not last in everything, or even close to it. We're a lot better. And my, my mother is looking down. She, was, she grew up in Calhoun City, Mississippi, and is 
was as southern as you could get, she's probably looking at me with a stink eye right now. Huh? Right. Sorry, Mom, but it's the truth. No southern congressional delegation or legislature would ever voluntarily approve and ratify amendments guaranteeing the rights of, afforded by the 14th and 15th Amendments. Of course, the 14th guarantee, the most important right under that guarantees equal protection of the laws. I mean, no matter what race you are, you have equal rights and you can't be discriminated against based on that. The 15th gives equal political rights, in essence, by prohibiting discrimination in voting rights. Very important. Now, the reason why Southern delegations and Southern legislatures are not going to ratify these amendments is that blocking ratification would preserve white supremacy and control over the, the slaves. So how, how did they achieve passage? The faction of the Republicans that favored certainly the, the, uh, the voting rights and the equal rights side of things were called the radicals. How many of y'all have heard of radical Republicans? Now, I don't really care for that term, but that's what they were called. And a lot of times that's what they called themselves. And they were proud of it. Basically, what they were trying to do is totally change the fabric of the nation, which even in the North, white supremacy. Uh, very limited voting rights or no voting rights for African Americans. Uh, blatant discrimination against African Americans. So this wasn't just a Southern thing. So um, these radicals were called radicals even by Northerners because they disagreed with trying to play with the race issue in terms of voting and, and uh, discrimination. And the way that they wanted to go about getting these amendments adopted in Congress and ratified in the state legislatures is by having black suffrage imposed on the South, and then the legislatures and congressional delegations elected by a biracial electorate. Now, in some states like Mississippi, South Carolina, uh, Louisiana, there's a majority black. So, would those states be sending uh, black representatives even to Congress, be electing blacks to uh, state offices, governor, state legislatures, Supreme Courts? They pushed on Lincoln real hard to get that done. But if you read closely, and kind of ignore some of the things that Lincoln's biographers have written about him. And let me drop a footnote. If somebody is gonna write a biography about you, you want one of Lincoln's biographers to do it because you're gonna come out looking good. And, and any of your little flaws, for some reason they won't show up in there. But Lincoln didn't favor imposing black suffrage. And I know what a lot of people are gonna say, well, his last speech, he was favoring black suffrage. 
that's a myth among many myths about Lincoln. But why didn't he favor this? You know, basically it would put the slave power out of business in terms of the politics in the South. So why not? One reason is he's, he was sick of the war. Now, if you ever go into your computer and look at Library of Congress photographs of him, look at the photograph of him from 1860, and then compare it to his last photograph, which is in 1865. You always see that they'll show, you know, President Obama when he was first elected, and then they show him now a lot of gray hair. Guy still looks great, though, right? I mean, you know, may not like his politics, and I'm not political, but they did the same thing with George Bush. Here's what he looked like before. Here's what he looked like after. And I don't want to offend anybody when I say this, but if you look at Lincoln before and after, he looks like hell after. I mean, if there wasn't something bad wrong with him uh, physically or mentally, I would be shocked. And I know a lot of people have delved into that, but there's not a lot of evidence one way or the other. He was sick of the war. Just sick of it. Sick of the bloodshed. Sick of letters he got from widows and children. Sick. The national debt was ever increasing. In the book, you'll see what the North was spending on a daily basis. It was huge. The national debt was larger in 1865 than it had ever been in the nation's history. And like now, you know, we're kind of, we kind of walk around going, well, you know, we're up in the 20 trillion plus uh, debts. And, and people are saying, well, you know, bad things are going to happen. They haven't yet. But no one can say it won't happen, that bad things won't occur. It was the same thing back then. People were really scared about even if, if the South quit immediately, where would the North be and where would the country be in terms of the debt? Because a debt is a major problem. Certainly back then it was as well. It's a little problem. Lincoln, like his generals, feared guerrilla warfare was, would break out, even if generals like Lee and some of the others surrendered. And they would get aid, it was believed, from the French who controlled Mexico. You ever heard of Maximilian? Ever watched the movie Outlaw Josie Wells? I mean, where, where are they going? They're going to Mexico. Why? Because they believed it was a safe haven for Confederates. And if you read some of the Southern press, certainly out in Louisiana and Texas during this period, they're begging people to come out there and let's light the fire again. It was, it was first lit there at Fort Sumter on the East Coast. Let's relight it out here in the West. Mexico could be used as a staging area. If you look at General Grant's correspondence, it's littered with these concerns. He wants to go into Mexico and clean it out. That's the only way to finish it because there will always be a problem if the French are there and they're having uh, collusion. Don't you love that word today? They're colluding with Confederates. What could happen? War could continue. And no one could afford to fight the war any longer. So Lincoln, 
is basically thinking, I just want the soldiers to go home. And as a matter of fact, he meets with a couple of his generals, Grant and Sherman, and also uh, one of his admirals, to talk about that very thing of how he wanted the war to end, and as he put it, let them up easy, let them go home, resume their peaceful pursuits, no guerrilla warfare. But are they going to be willing to do that? What if he says, we're going to impose black suffrage on you? Confederates, if the war ends and when the war ends, if he says that the war never ends, and there's a lot of people that will argue that it never did end uh, for decades after that, and of course the the bone of contention was voting rights and white supremacy. So what Lincoln had been doing, knowing that it would eventually come to this, is he would, had been moving away from the radical Republican faction of his party for some time. He had proposed very liberal uh, methodology for having the states return. Uh, he had what was called the 10% plan which made it very easy for new governments in the South to be formed. He had pocket vetoed the radicals proposal uh, that was co called the Wade Davis bill that made it a lot tougher for new state governments to form. He had announced that he would liberally use his pardoning policy. Many in the North wanted at least the Confederate military and political leaders to be executed. He had attempted to reach a peace accord with the Confederacy or Confederate representatives in February of 1865 at the Hampton Roads Peace Conference. And the, the terms that were discussed in there uh, will raise your eyebrows. And the find out what they are, you got to read the book. The South blew a huge opportunity at that, that peace of conference. You know, so you, we're, we're looking over uh, in the Orient about North Korea, South Korea, and, you know, a lot of people are getting almost giddy that there's going to be a resolution of it, and golly, I'm one of those that wants to see it. And golly, when the peace commissioners walked or went through the, the uh, military lines back in 1865, they went through the Confederate lines. The Confederates all stood up and clapped. Hooray. Peace, finally. They were so optimistic. Then a funny thing happens, and a very telling thing happens. Those commissioners then move through Union lines. What do the Union soldiers do? They stand up and clap, thinking, we're going to get peace here. Well, there's a culprit. There is a person, and he's Southern, and I won't name his name right this minute because you'll see it when you read the book that prevented a resolution at that time. Lincoln could have been upset with that. If things don't go well over in Korea, uh, I would imagine our president is going to be very upset at that if, if we don't succeed over there. But even after that, he still favored the South's speedy return and was willing to do the necessary to make sure that occurred. In his second inaugural address, rather than railing about the South not wanting to resolve this, you recall that he talked about 
malice toward none, and charity for all. Very New Testament. Basically, he's sending a message. He's sweet-talking to the South. That drove a lot of his Republican, uh, radical Republican faction very, uh, they were very upset about this. And he also, Shudder, after returning from the peace conference, he proposes in, in a cabinet meeting about uh, favoring compensation by the federal government to the slave owners to get them to give up their slaves. As his, uh, his cabinet talked him out of that. Covertly, we've heard the word covertly in the last two years a lot, haven't we? He was behind efforts that were being made to establish a colony in Panama. And that colony would be for the African Americans who had fought for the nation. They were going to be deployed, not mustered out, but deployed down to Panama to build the canal that had been under consideration for a long time. They would be supervised by a general who was a radical Republican named Benjamin Butler. And you'll see in the book how Lincoln convinces Butler to do this because it's totally foreign to the way he thought about things. And you'll find out when you read the book. Now I will tell you too Lincoln had a lot of support for his opposition to the radical Republicans. He, um, the, the mainstream Republican press, which believe it or not, at this time, included the New York Times. <laughs> um, and I found this very striking. In February of 1865, the editor argued that not only was the question of deciding who should vote an essential state right, which Congress could not interfere with, but the former slaves were hardly more competent to vote on public questions than beasts of the field. Now I'll shock you. There's a lot of shocking things in the book. But we know at the end, Lincoln is assassinated, and so his plan is not implemented. And then the rest of Reconstruction is a fight between Andrew Johnson, his successor, who, believe it or not, was actually trying to implement Lincoln's plan and the Republicans in Congress who were seething about the assassination outwardly. They were happy about it inwardly. I've been told I've got just a couple of minutes to answer questions, if any. Um, you have, yeah, let me grab the microphone for you real quick. All right. And I will stay here all afternoon if you want to ask questions. This won't be on tape. All right. We are recording today's session. If you would please raise your hand and either myself or Wesley will pass you the microphone. Thank you, Mr. McElwain. Yes, um, sir. You don't have to stand up. Oh, okay. The last time states tried to secede, it really didn't turn out very well. Bad idea. There's a state out there on the West Coast, politicians and some people are challenging the federal supremacy. As a lawyer, put on your lawyer hat and be the lawyer for California and against that issue, which, of course, it ain't going to happen, but you know what I mean. Well, if I'm the lawyer for California, I say, uh, we need to change ideas here because this isn't a good one. Um, secession never turns out well if there's a president in office that's going to stand up to it. What would Trump do if that occurred? <laughs> Maybe what Lincoln did. Another question. 
Would you be so kind as to read a paragraph from your book? Okay, sure. Thank you. Let me pick a short one. Jesus wept. <laughs> um, well, I just read part of a paragraph talking about uh, black suffrage. And I'll continue. At the Times editor conceded that, quote, whether the southern states, if restored, restored at once to their full state rights, would not abuse them by an oppression of the black race, was an important factor in deciding the degree of discretionary power that should be accorded to them. But he also maintained that the great end was to get every southern state back so that it shall perform the same obligations and exercise the same rights identically that are performed and exercised by every northern state. You'll see throughout the book, it's chock full of what the opinion makers were saying through, through that period. None of this stuff is made up. It's all sitting out there. And a lot of it's been, been sitting out there in plain view for a long time, but it took me about 25 years to get through it, and uh, historians have to get their books out a lot sooner than I do. So I had a little advantage. Yes, sir. So your thesis is that it, had Lincoln not been assassinated and implemented his plan for reconstruction, black suffrage probably would not have been or may not have been part of that, and it would have retarded the efforts, those efforts. It, it would have definitely retarded them for a long time. Uh, my sense is, just knowing the American spirit, that it, things would have, have evolved. Uh, because again, it's state rights, so the states could always implement uh, voting rights, for example, or rights uh, that uh, deal with employment and some other issues. And my sense is, is over a period of time, I mean, we've changed in our lifetimes. I think the South would have changed too, eventually. But the, the effort or the act of imposing black suffrage on the South, you know, that, that just set off a, a series of explosions that continued until really not too long ago, certainly in our lifetimes. I'm, I'm, yes, sure sir. Th I'm sure that you answered this question in your presentation. Don't but, say that. <laughs> but let me ask it again. That, uh, the cause of the Civil War, slavery, states' rights, or both? Well, when people say state rights, they're talking about slavery and white supremacy and, and the ability of states to control those things. Uh, but, but the main cause of the war, and it's in my first book, Civil War Alabama, I boiled it down after reading everything, I think. I boiled it down to fear. You know, John Brown's raid had come through, come into Virginia in October of 1864 right before the national, uh, excuse me, uh, no, I'm sorry, 1859. That scared the heck out of people, especially when they found maps in Brown's uh, luggage that gave, excuse me, gave the, uh, the course of, of what he was going to do. He was going to move from Virginia all the way through the South including coming through here in Selma. Basically, he was going to go through each state's black belt in a sense of where the largest slave concentrations was. And so people were on edge. And fear is a huge motivator. And a lot of people said, including a lot of people in Montgomery, said, well, we don't have any choice, especially if, if Lincoln's elected because We'll just have a whole lot of John Browns come down here. Of course, Brown was captured and hung, but 
if you look at the newspapers in Alabama and really the other southern states for 1860, they're beating the drum. We're going to have more John Browns come down, and we're going to have a race war. That's what caused the Civil War, is the secession that was triggered by these fears. And, a, and again, this is in my first book, and a Reconstruction movement that began right after secession but before war that caused uh, the Confederate leadership to be concerned that some of the states would backslide out of the Confederacy when they found out what it really entailed. That's when the order was given to fire on Fort Sumter, is to stop that uh, Reconstruction movement. Hi. Hey. Um, I listened just and I enjoyed your book, and I noticed the title said, From Civil War to an Uncivil Peace. And I guess you're looking at the uncivil peace from the mechanism that even after slavery ended officially, there was a lot of history that shows that there was a lot of fighting here in the South to maintain the status quo. And yet you said that you think that slavery would have ended if not for the war. Did I hear that? You thought it might would have? Because it would have evolved. But yeah, I'm, I'm just talking about eventually I think it would have ended. Here's why. Slavery worked Literally, econo like economically, uh, not for everybody, but it worked as long as there was land that could be farmed using a plantation system where you have large numbers of laborers. The problem was that in many parts of the Old South, the land was going bad. The, the procedures or techniques that were used to farm cotton back in that time were very destructive of the land. A whole lot of the land, for example, up in North Alabama was just shot. It had been farmed since the 18 teens, and nobody was putting any fertilizer there because they didn't have the modern fertilizers. And besides, the profit margin on cotton was so slight, they couldn't afford to bring in things that might fertilize. And so there would come a time when there wasn't enough land. And there would, be, there would come a time when there were too many slaves. And that's why, you know, you, you've read probably about uh, the Kansas, Nebraska, that sort of thing, the, the conflict there in the 1850s about whether or not Kansas would come in as a, uh, a slave state. Let me disabuse you. Most Alabamians didn't give a wit about Kansas because the land up there really didn't, or there wasn't enough to, to make a difference as far as from, from Alabamians' concerns and other planters in the South. The South wanted to go south, Central America, Cuba, and further on, and basically shift the um, the slaves out, sell them off to people who could use those farmlands, but the North was not allowing expansion into Kansas, or was trying to prevent it, and they were prohibiting movement south. So basically there would come a time when you didn't have the land, you had too many slaves, what you gonna do? You know, they probably, uh, I mean, you can think of some very negative things that could be yes, done. Yes, that's what I'm thinking. It would be, yes. Because power never makes a concession. And, and we look at our government today, and even as we look at different aspects of it, and um, as an African-American, I hear a lot of talk, but you still have 
people of my race who think that the better solution would have been that we all did leave and form our own economy. And, you know, Marcus Garvey was not the only person that felt that way. And there have been others, but yet you have to look at, I don't think it would have happened that we would have had a peaceful solution. We still don't, we are working at it together today, but the human nature in itself, there are good people all around. We can look in this room, great people. But we know that people like power, people like money, and some people will consider, would do whatever they have to in their conscience. Like you said about Lincoln, I've seen the movie. He, there was a lot, we look at historically, even in King, whoever you're looking at, we all have our flaws. And it right. wasn't a perfect piece that he was thinking. Sometimes they're looking at the better of our country. But I just don't think it would have just ended eventually uh, because there were so many interventions. We can look at today, look at gerrymandering. And you can look at all of these as small evolutions throughout that whole process. Well, money talks. Oh, yes. And if you're a planner and you don't have the land to plant a, 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 a good cotton crop or get a good price for it, what you gonna do? The, the slaves are your, quote, property. And therefore you could decide to kill rather than sell without time to And you could try to turn them loose, but Alabama had laws that prohibited that. So, is it time? It is. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to our speaker, and we were free to uh, speak with him after. Also, copies of his book are available for purchase in the lobby. Thank you. Thank y'all. So